Welcome to SDN Tech Networking Podcast, world's first human-curated AI podcast where we break down complex topics into bite-sized, easy-to-digest pieces. Ever find yourself in those tech meetings? You know the ones where everyone's throwing around terms like LoRaWAN and you're kind of nodding along, pretending to get it? Ah, oh, yes, the classic tech jargon head nod. We've all been there. Well, fear no more, because today's deep dive is all about LoRaWAN ready to demystify this whole long-range, low-power networking thing. And it's about more than just buzzwords, right? We're talking about the tech that's quietly powering everything from, like, smart cities to, believe it or not, smart farms. Exactly. So let's untangle this web. One thing I always trip up on, Laura versus LoRaWAN. They sound like they should be on a family reunion t-shirt or something. They really do. Think of it like this. Laura is the engine, and LoRaWAN is the roadmap. Laura, the physical layer, that's what handles actually transmitting the data. Like, imagine radio waves carrying a song. LoRaWAN, that's the set of rules that make sure all the devices on the network can talk to each other without causing a communication meltdown. Okay, so LoRa is the how we send the message, and LoRaWAN is like the traffic cop making sure everything flows smoothly. Precisely. It's a communication protocol, just like any other, and just like with any communication system, security is paramount. Right. We can't have data flying around willy-nilly. One of the videos mentioned encryption keys. How does LoRaWAN handle that whole keeping things safe aspect? Imagine you're sending a secret message, and only you and the recipient have the decoder ring. It's basically scrambling the message so anyone snooping just hears gibberish. Sounds pretty secure. But I'm guessing it's not always that straightforward, right? You hit the nail on the head. It all boils down to how those keys are managed. You've got options like pre-shared keys, which are simpler to set up, but, well, less secure. Imagine hiding your house key under the doormat. Convenient, but risky. Not exactly Fort Knox. Exactly. And LoRaWAN has ways to beef up security if you need that higher level of protection. And that's where, what was it called? Device provisioning comes in, making sure those keys are, like, baked into the device from the start. Spot on. Compromise provisioning is a weak link in the chain. Think of it like leaving the back door to your network wide open. Secure provisioning is key, literally, to long-term network security. Makes sense. Okay, so we've talked about security, but what about some of the other technical stuff? Don't worry, we'll keep it light. One video kept mentioning spreading factors. What are those and why should we care? Okay, imagine whispering a secret versus yelling it across a crowded room. Higher spreading factor, you're shouting further reach, but you're going to lose your voice faster. Exactly. Higher spreading factor equals longer range, but at the cost of battery life. Yeah. It's a trade-off, but crucial for, say, those remote sensors in the middle of nowhere. Fascinating. And I'm guessing other factors come into play, not just the spreading factor thing. What about, like, coding rates or bandwidths? You're on fire today. Think of bandwidth like a pipe. Carrying data, bigger pipe, more data, but maybe more prone to interference. Coding rate is like adding redundancy to your message. It eats up more data, but make sure it gets through even with some hiccups. All about finding that sweet spot for your specific needs. Okay, so all this talk about spreading factors and bandwidths has got me wondering, could I, a non-engineer, set up my own LoRaWAN network? It might sound daunting, but it's more doable than you'd think. Essentially, you need three main ingredients, gateways, nodes, and a network server. So gateways, those are like the... The middlemen. They grab the signals from your nodes and pass them onto the network server. Like a relay race for data. And the nodes are the ones out in the field sending the info back to the gateway. Do those, like, come in different flavors? Big time. You've got everything from these minuscule lore one modules. I mean, we're talking smaller than those header pins you use for electronics projects, all the way up to heavy-duty industrial-grade things. Wait, smaller than header pins? How do you even work with something that tiny? That's where carrier boards and breakout boards become your best friend. They give you a more, shall we say, manageable interface. Makes sense. So with those teeny modules, I'm guessing antenna choice is make or break, right? You bet. Antenna type? Even something as seemingly simple as the length of the wire can drastically affect your range, especially with such small devices. Hold on. The length of the wire matters. How does that even work? Think of it like tuning a guitar string. The length changes the note. In this case, the wire needs to resonate at just the right frequency for LoRaWAN. Wow, okay, so there's a whole science to these antennas. We've got gateways, nodes. What about this network server part? Are we talking like renting space in a giant data center somewhere? Not necessarily. 
You could go with a ready-made solution like the Things Network, or if you're feeling adventurous, you could roll up your sleeves and build your own using a Raspberry Pi and some off-the-shelf parts. DIY network server sounds ambitious, to say the least. Is that even something a beginner could wrap their head around? It depends on your comfort level, but there's a ton of support out there. Online guides, forums, the whole shebang. Uh, Plus, that feeling when you get it up and running yourself. Yeah. Priceless. I bet. Okay, we've covered the basics, but what about real-world uses? Where is Laura One actually making a difference out there in the wild? Get ready for some aha moments, because Laura One is popping up everywhere. We're talking smart cities, spinning trash cans that tell you when they're full to agriculture, mm. with sensors out in the fields monitoring soil moisture so farmers know exactly when and where to water their crops. Okay, that's seriously cool. Seems like the possibilities are pretty much endless, but I'm guessing there are challenges, right? I remember one video mentioned duty cycle limitations. What's that all about? Think of it like having a time limit when you're using a walkie-talkie. You can't just hog the airwaves, right? So it's about preventing network traffic jams, making sure everyone gets a turn to transmit. Exactly. Plus, it helps conserve battery life, which is super important for those off-grid devices. Makes sense. And while we're on the topic of potential downsides, what about security in the real world? Those encryption keys we talked about, how vulnerable are they in practice? That's the million-dollar question. Yeah. Remember device provisioning. If that's not done securely, it's like leaving the keys in the ignition. So even with built-in security features, there's always a chance for human error or someone with less than noble intentions to find a way in. Unfortunately, yes. Security is an ongoing battle, not a one-time fix. It takes constant vigilance from, well, everyone involved, the folks designing the systems, the ones deploying them, and even the end users. It's like a constant game of cat and mouse between the good guys and the bad guys. Exactly. As technology evolves, so do the ways people try to exploit it. Staying informed and up to date on the latest security best practices is crucial for anyone working with LoRaWAN. So it's not just about, you know, building a cool gadget, but thinking about the bigger picture. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with harnessing a technology like this. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that really hit me while going through these videos was just how massive the potential impact of LoRaWAN could be. I mean, we're talking about a future where practically everything around us is sending and receiving data. It's kind of mind-blowing, right? But let's bring it back down to Earth for a sec. One of the videos mentioned that LoRaWAN modules can be unbelievably small, or we're talking smaller than a grain of rice. How does that tiny size actually play out in, like, real-world applications. Miniaturization is a game-changer. Those tiny modules open up a whole new world of possibilities, especially when it comes to, say, discrete monitoring and data collection. Imagine tracking valuable shipments, monitoring environmental conditions in, like, really hard-to-reach places, or even tracking animal migration patterns. So it's not just the tech itself, but how it's physically embodied that allows for these new use cases. That's pretty cool. But those tiny devices must come with their own design and implementation challenges, right? You're telling me. Working with components that's small requires some serious skill and specialized tools. Just imagine trying to solder something that tiny. And then there's the issue of power consumption. To make these things last, they have to be incredibly energy efficient, often running on tiny batteries. It's a constant balancing act, isn't it? Size, power, performance. You know, all this talk about LoRaWAN has me feeling kind of inspired. It seems like a really exciting field. What advice would you give to someone who's interested in exploring it further, maybe even building their own projects? It is exciting and more accessible than you might think. My advice, start small. Don't be afraid to experiment. There are tons of resources out there, online tutorials, open source projects. You can even get kits with all the components you need to get your feet wet. That's good to know. It's not just for the big tech companies then. Anyone can get involved. Are there any specific projects or applications that you find particularly interesting? One area I'm really fascinated by is the use of LoRaWAN in environmental monitoring and conservation. Imagine a network of sensors spread across a rainforest, collecting data on everything. Temperature, humidity, animal movement, deforestation. That would be incredible. Talk about using technology for good. It's not just about connecting devices. It's about connecting us to the natural world in a more meaningful way. Exactly. And that's what I find so compelling about Loron. It has the potential to make our lives more efficient and connected, but also to help us understand and tackle some of the biggest challenges facing our planet. And that brings us to another important aspect that we need to talk about, the potential downsides and risks associated with a technology as powerful as LoRaWAN. Absolutely. Like any tool, 
it can be misused. We've touched on the surveillance aspect, but there's also the whole issue of data security and privacy, especially with more and more devices coming online all the time. It's about finding that balance, right? Harnessing the power of the technology, but making sure it's used ethically and responsibly. One of the videos really emphasized the importance of having strong security measures in place, like encryption and authentication, to prevent unauthorized access and data breaches. Security is paramount, no question, especially as LoRaWAN becomes more integrated into things like power grids, transportation systems, healthcare. These systems need to be designed with security in mind from the ground up. It's a shared responsibility, really. It's up to the engineers who design the systems, the people who deploy them, and the everyday users to be aware of the risks and to use LoRaWAN safely and responsibly. I couldn't agree more. And part of that is educating ourselves, mm -hmm. understanding the risks, and advocating for responsible development practices. Well said. This deep dive has been a real eye-opener. We started by breaking down the basics of LoRaWAN, and we've ended up discussing its vast potential impact on everything, from smart cities to the environment, while also acknowledging the challenges that come with such a transformative technology. It's been quite a journey, and we've covered a lot of ground, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to learn and explore in the world of LoRaWAN. And that's what makes it so exciting, right? It's a constantly evolving field with endless possibilities. Exactly. And to our listeners, we'll leave you with this thought. As LoRaWAN continues to shape the future of connectivity, what role will you play? Will you be a builder, an innovator, a watchdog, making sure it's used responsibly, or just an informed citizen? The choice is yours. It's like we've been saying all along, size isn't everything. Though it's pretty amazing how those tiny LoRaWAN modules can be so powerful. It really speaks to how far we've come in terms of miniaturization, right? But what really gets me is how that translates to real-world impact. I mean, we're talking about tracking endangered species, monitoring remote pipelines for leaks, all with these tiny low-power devices. It's incredible. It almost sounds too good to be true. Which brings me to, well, there are always two sides to every coin, aren't there? Right. No technology is perfect, and Laura Wan is no exception. For all its potential, we have to remember there are still challenges to address, especially when it comes to security and privacy. Yeah, those concerns definitely came up in the videos we watched. I mean, the more connected devices there are, the more potential entry points there are for bad actors, right? Exactly. Think about it, if someone hacks into a single sensor, it might not seem like a huge deal. But now imagine they gain control over a whole network of sensors in a critical infrastructure system. Suddenly the stakes are a lot higher. Okay, that's a pretty scary thought. So how do we mitigate those risks? Is it even possible to secure something as complex and decentralized as a LoRaWAN network? It's a challenge, for sure, but not an insurmountable one. A lot of it comes down to implementing robust security measures at every level, from the device itself to the network architecture and everything in between. So it's not just about encryption keys and secure authentication, but about a holistic approach to security. Exactly. We need to be thinking about things like secure boot processes, tamper-proof hardware, and even secure element chips that store sensitive data in a way that's virtually impossible to hack. It sounds like security in the lower one world is a multi-layered beast. Yeah. What about the ethical implications? We've talked about the potential for good, but what about the potential for misuse? That's a conversation we can't afford to shy away from. Like any powerful technology, LoRaWAN can be used for good or bad. It's up to us as a society to establish clear ethical guidelines and regulations for its development and deployment. So it's not just a tech issue, but a societal one. Hmm. We need to be thinking about things like data privacy, consent, and accountability. Who has access to the data collected by these networks? How is that data being used? These are questions we need to be asking. Absolutely. And it's not just up to policymakers and regulators. Tech companies, developers, everyone involved in building and deploying these networks has a responsibility to consider the ethical implications of their work. It really feels like we're at a crossroads with LoRaWAN and with a lot of emerging technologies, really. We have this incredible power at our fingertips, but with great power comes great responsibility, right? Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, it's an exciting time to be involved in this field, but also a time for careful consideration and honestly, some tough conversations. Well, we've definitely covered a lot of ground in this deep dive, from the technical intricacies of LoRaWAN to its vast potential and the very real challenges and ethical considerations we need to address. It's been quite a journey. We've explored smart cities, delved into the world of precision agriculture, and even pondered the future of environmental monitoring, all through the lens of this fascinating technology. 
And we've learned that LoRaWAN is more than just a network protocol. It's a catalyst for innovation, a tool for positive change, and a reminder that the future is not something that simply happens to us. It's something we create consciously and collaboratively. Well said. So to our listeners, as we wrap up this deep dive into the world of LoRaWAN, we leave you with this, what will you build? How will you contribute to this exciting and rapidly evolving landscape? The future of LoRaWAN and indeed the future of our connected world is waiting to be written. And we can't wait to see what you come up with.